In this video, we're going to explore the most common microgreens crops. In doing so, we're going to look at both individual crops as well as crop families. I'll also share some expected yield figures for common crops and discuss the importance of substitution when choosing crops for your system. Let's start with the largest group of crops you will encounter in the microgreens world, and that is the Brassicaceae family. It's a mouthful, I know. Within this family, there are three important microgreens groups. The coal crops, the mustards, and the radishes. So let's take a look at each one of those individually. So you may not be familiar with the term coal crops, but you're likely familiar with the crops themselves. The group includes the very popular broccoli, along with cabbage, kohlrabi, collards, turnip, and kale. There's others as well, but these are the most common coal crops grown as microgreens. Each of these crops has the same scientific name, Brassica oleracea. This means they freely cross-pollinate with each other as mature flowering plants. So the coal crops all share a common ancestor, and selection pressure over hundreds of years has resulted in many variations of this crop group, which is mature crops have edible leaves, flowers, or stems. Why is it good to know why the coal crops are so similar? Easy. It means they all grow in a very similar way, in similar conditions, and as a microgreen, they are almost indifferentiable. One of the main differences we see in some of the coal crops is in their rate of growth. Crops that are more commonly grown over winter as a mature crop, like cabbage, tend to grow just a little slower as a microgreen, so kind of a crop cycle that is one or two days longer than the faster growing kohlrabi or broccoli. There is some color variation between the coal crops too, with some varieties exhibiting red, purple, or pink leaves or stems. So when thinking of a substitute for a coal crop, make sure it's in a similar color. The coal crops all tend to have a yield within the same range of about 8 to 12 ounces per 1020 tray, and have a crop cycle of 7 to 10 days when grown to the cotyledon stage. Some growers do take coal crops to the true leaf stage as well, and that just means a longer crop cycle. Coal crops do well in a wide range of temperatures, but do best in a range between of about 75 and 82 Fahrenheit. Too much below this temperature and they grow slowly, and too much above this temperature and they grow, well, reluctantly. The coal crops are one of the most important crop families for microgreens, so it's important to be familiar with them and know how to grow them. Luckily, they're pretty easy to grow. There are several mustard varieties that are popular with microgreens growers, including Mizuna, Tatsoi, yellow, brown, red mustard, and many more. Mustards have pretty much the same growing parameters as the coal crops, yielding 8 to 12 ounces per tray on a 7 to 10 day crop cycle. Some mustards are pretty much indifferentiable from the coal crops when young, so they can easily be substituted because they look and taste very much the same. One difference is, is that mustards basically have a little bit of a spicy kick, and there's definitely some variation in spiciness in the mustards. So be sure to sample your crops often to get familiar with their overall flavor distinctness and spice levels. And keep in mind, spice levels can change with your growing methods as well, so there's a lot of parameters to consider. Mustards also have some variation in stem and leaf color. So like the coal crops, when substituting varieties, try to match up color as much as you can. Pro tip. To anticipate future substitutions in a product mix, be sure to add a may contain list to your product descriptions. Radish definitely stands out from the closely related coal crops and mustards, being a much faster growing and higher yielding crop. Radish can be an incredibly fast growing crop, reaching a harvestable size in as little as five days. They're a great way to add color and spice to a microgreens mix, coming in a wide range of white, red, purple, and pink stems, as well as some varieties with deep red purple leaves. Radish yields can range from 12 to 18 ounces per tray and grow on a cycle from five to eight days. They do well in slightly cooler conditions than the coal crops, preferring a temperature range between 72 to 79 Fahrenheit. Coal crops, mustards, and radishes are all nutrition powerhouses, so be sure to include them in as many product mixes as you can. Broccoli is often touted as the superior cancer-fighting microgreen due to its high sulforaphane content, but a 2019 study showed that both mustard and radish can have much higher levels of this compound than broccoli. Sunflower shoots are a popular choice for microgreens growers. They're high-yielding, 
fast growing, nutritious, tasty, and very popular with consumers. Really, they're the perfect crop. Sunflowers prefer warm conditions, so make sure to give them some heat. They do well in a temperature range from 75 to 86 Fahrenheit, and even warmer. But keep in mind, the warmer it gets, the more water they'll need. Sunflowers grow in a 7 to 9 day cycle and can yield anywhere from 20 to 30 ounces or more per 1020 tray. Sunflower seeds are typically soaked before sowing to help induce germination. Usually a soak time of 1 to 4 hours is sufficient, depending on the seed lot. Some growers have success with overnight soaks, but in general this is usually not necessary. One of the biggest challenges many growers have with sunflowers is getting them to shed their hulls. Growing sunflowers at a higher temperature makes them more vigorous and helps shed hulls more easily. You can also brush your hand lightly over the canopy once or twice each day to help knock the hulls loose. Unlike the crops we just discussed, there's no range of sunflower types varying in leaf or stem color. They're simply black oil sunflower seeds, though there is some variation in seed size. Pro tip! Sunflower seed lots are notoriously variable and can have very different growing preferences from seed lot to seed lot. Be sure to thoroughly test any new lots of sunflower seeds before making a large purchase. Pea shoots are another common microgreen crop. They're very easy to grow and can thrive in a variety of conditions. They do prefer cooler temperatures, with a range between 72 to 79 Fahrenheit being optimal, but they can also handle the heat fairly well. There are a number of pea varieties to choose from, and yields can vary significantly between varieties. Shorter pea shoots like yellow and green pea form tendrils early in their development and yield between 14 to 17 ounces per tray. Taller varieties like speckled and Oregon sugar giant form tendrils late in their development and yield between 17 to 21 ounces per tray. Pea seeds need a good soak before sowing and do well with a 12 hour or overnight soak. Peas are one of the easiest microgreens to grow. They have no hulls to shed and tolerate a wide range of conditions. They're also one of the more familiar crops to consumers, which can make for a much easier sale. Wheatgrass, though not technically a microgreen, is basically grown in the same manner as microgreens. It is also another easy crop to grow, doing best in cooler temperatures between 72 to 79 Fahrenheit, much like peas. Wheatgrass struggles to grow in temperatures too much above this, so do your best to keep your temperatures down when growing lots of wheatgrass. Wheatgrass can yield anywhere from 300 to 400 grams per tray and grows on a 6 to 8 day cycle. Wheatgrass does well with a quick seed soak anywhere from 20 minutes to 2 hours long. Wheatgrass is unique as a microgreen for two reasons. First, it's not eaten but rather juiced into a nutrient dense tonic. I personally prefer mine with an espresso chaser. Uh, be warned though, the juice is very intense and will often leave you feeling something like this poor fellow here. Wheatgrass is often sold in live trays as wheatgrass purists really uh, prefer to juice fresh cut grass over a packaged product, but packaged products can maintain their quality well for a week easily. Pro tip! It is tempting to grow wheatgrass quite tall in order to increase your yield, but this always leads to two problems. Number one, white mold starts to form at the soil surface, and number two, juicing quality declines significantly if the crop is even one day over mature. It's quite difficult to convey the exact best time to harvest wheatgrass, but it's usually around the 6-7 to seven day mark, when the crop is like a little less than 8 inches tall. I typically know it's time to harvest my wheatgrass when I notice myself saying, it just needs one more day. It does not just need one more day, it's ready to harvest now. There are dozens if not hundreds of different types of microgreens. Almost any vegetable can be grown as a microgreen, as can many flowers and herbs. Other microgreens you will come across include amaranth, beet, chives, cress, borage, and so many more. So I encourage you to grow a wide range of microgreens, but suggest you start with the crops we covered here today so you can get off to a successful start in your microgreens growing endeavors. Oh I know, that was such a great natural ending point, but there's just a few more quick things that I want to cover. Earlier in this video I mentioned substitutions a few times, and I want to come back to that briefly since some of you might be asking yourself, why was he talking about substitutions before? Now there's basically three main reasons for making substitutions. And when I'm talking about a substitution, what I mean is if you have a product mix with a crop in it, you would replace that crop with another crop. And these are the reasons why. 
The first and main reason you might want to make a crop substitution is you cannot find the seed of your preferred crops. Unfortunately, it's actually quite common for suppliers to run out of seed, even of the most popular seed varieties. This usually just happens for short period of times. In these situations, if you can't get the seed, you can either order an alternative to substitute for your preferred seed, or use the seed of another crop you already have in stock that is a suitable substitution. Of course, it's best that you never run out of your preferred seed, so be sure to order your next batch of seeds well before you actually need them to ensure you're always well stocked with the seed you prefer. The second reason you might want to substitute one crop for another is if you have a crop failure. If your broccoli crop fails, maybe you'll have some extra turnip you can add to a mix instead of the broccoli. Or if your Triton radish has a lower yield than expected one week, you can substitute with ruby stem radish that uh, maybe happened to perform better that week. The third reason to do a substitution is if you can find a much better seed price for a less popular but equivalent crop to one you already grow. Seed prices can vary significantly between different crop types, so this can be an easy way to keep your costs down. Everybody is going to have their own reason for choosing specific crops in the end. In general, I use four guidelines when deciding which crops I want to grow. Number one, how easy is the crop to grow? There are a few crops I've just never had any success with, so I simply don't grow them. Basil, for example. The common crops we just covered here are all pretty easy to grow and have a lot of variation in size, color, and flavor profile, giving you everything you need to have a great product line. Number two is market demand. You may love growing chervil, borage, or cilantro microgreens, but if no one wants to buy them, then there's really no point in growing them. The common crops we covered here are typically good sellers in most markets, which is another reason why they're such good starting points for new growers. But eventually you'll want to expand your product line, so talk to your customers to find out what they're interested in, and grow some new crops to see which ones grow best in your system. It won't take long to add some unique crops to your offerings. The third consideration I have is the crop cycle. If you have limited space, as many microgreens growers do, then you'll want to focus on short cycle crops of 10 days or less. This allows you to get a crop in and out of your system quickly to make room for the next crop, and then the next one, and then the next one. But if your space is not too limited, you can add a whole range of longer cycle crops that could attract a whole new clientele base. Jacob Goldfarb of Gold Farm Canada started off with the basic crops like most growers do, but quickly found a niche with restaurants who wanted more of his longer cycle crops, including edible flowers and herbs. And the fourth consideration I have with choosing crops is seed availability and price. There are crops that I might like to grow, but the seed is just notoriously hard to procure on a regular basis, or it's just way too expensive. So I really just don't bother with them. Now, you may think this could equate to like lost opportunity to grow a niche crop that no one else is growing, but competition in the microgreens world is usually not that tight. And the niche crop you're looking for might just be that less expensive seed that no one else is growing. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. So hopefully that was a useful look at some of the most common microgreens crops, which are great for new growers and experts alike. As you saw, there's lots of variation within these crops, so creating a diverse product line is very easy. Remember that a lot of common crops are very similar, so grow in similar conditions and can often be substituted for one another in a mix. Once you've got a good handle on the common crops, then you can start branching into other crops to expand your product line and your growing experience. <music>